Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about trees with Emily Zweihart, but before we get to Emily, we have to introduce uh, my co-host with me every single week. We are joined by horticulture educator and magician extraordinaire, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hello, Ken. Hello, Chris. I have no magical abilities whatsoever. I don't know. You I'm can sorry. grow some you can grow some pretty amazing vegetables. The uh, artichoke picture you sent me this weekend looked pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I may have to grow those from now on. And yeah. maybe not even eat them, just grow them for the flowers. Oh, they're just beautiful. Yeah. Listeners, uh, Ken has grown artichoke plants and the flowers have opened up. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, I also grew artichokes and they're about an ankle high, not really doing anything. So I, I tried, Ken, I, I like follow the instructions. It's like they're biennials, so you have to expose them to cold. So I had them in a flat, it was like 15, and I took them outside in the spring. I let them hit, get a little frosted, killed all but three. <laughs> <laughs> I planted those three and they've done absolutely nothing all year. So I, um, I'm gonna stop by and just marvel at yours. Yeah, I don't know what we did. This is definitely a do as I say, not as I do here, because we didn't keep very good notes on anything. Mm -hmm. Couldn't tell you when I started the seeds. It was sometime in February, I think. Couldn't tell you when I put them outside. But we did pick, we picked a variety that is kind of a short season meant for more northern climates. So it mm -hmm. produces a little bit faster. So that may be where I lucked out at. That might be my problem then. Yeah. I apologize. I'm, I'm itching everywhere. So if you're watching this video, um, I did get in a mess of chiggers <laughs> last <laughs> week. We, um, so we did a prairie walk last Friday and it was beautiful. It was amazing. We are in a semi drought here in West Central Illinois. So it was pretty dry, but the prairie was still performing nicely. Um, and then just about a day later, I just started itching and my ankles are covered and other places too. So, um, but, but we don't want to talk about that. Let's, let's, I'm really excited for today's show, Ken. Um, Ken, you are thinking about you know, looking at becoming a certified arborist. And so, um, you know, is this, a, so trees are kind of topic you're interested in, right? Yeah, we get a lot of tree questions. And I don't know. Oh, I know enough to be dangerous. We'll put it that way. Yeah. And so, yes, I need to broaden my horizons on trees. Yes. So I, I think we have the, the perfect person for this and I'm so happy to have her here. I, I know her very well. Um, horticulture educator, Emily Zweihart, uh, in Moline, I believe. Is that where you're at today, Emily? Close. Milan is where Milan. our office is, but Rock Island County. Yep. Okay. Okay. I I think I know towns in Illinois, but I don't. I'm guessing. I'm kidding. It's I just right up. next to us. We're just right yes. over there. Okay. Yes. So Emily, you are up in the Quad Cities area, horticulture educator, just like Ken and myself, but we went to school together, didn't we? We did. We've known each other for quite some time. Yes. Yeah, so I am so excited to be working with you once again here at U of I Extension. So um, you're a year old here. Um, how are things? Uh, we're all nice, right? We're all nice people. Absolutely. Um, and I'm not getting paid to say that. It, it's really been well, wonderful. Well, kind of. I mean, <laughs> aren't we all getting paid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, paid, I'm paid to serve the community. You guys That's are true. just bonus. There you go. There yeah. you go. No, Extension's a wonderful home to be at in terms of a, a place of employment. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very thankful to be here. Well, and and we're really happy to have you because you bring with um with you being here, there is a lot that you bring to the table. Um, you know, our, our when we went to school, we studied landscape architecture together. And so that's a pretty broad and diverse subject matter. I mean, you could kind of do whatever you wanted with that topic. Pretty but much. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, you've spent the last several years working for Trees Forever. Yep. Yeah, I had the uh, pleasure of working with a nonprofit organization that serves Iowa and Illinois primarily. Um, it's called Trees Forever. And we do similar work to Extension where we would uh, work with community members and um, primarily focus on tree planting, uh, tree care programs. Um, there was some native plant um, programs that we had. So the chiggers, I, uh, I understand well. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought but, I had them all. And then last night at like four in the morning, I was like between the toes. I'm like, how did that eat? Where, what? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. They are persistent little buggers. Yeah. Nice. 
Yep. So yeah, and, and joined extension a year ago. Um, an opportunity came up, and I was very pleased uh, to be able to take it. Well, we are happy to have you here because because trees really are you know one of our biggest investments that we put out into the landscape, and so um, you know they're they're a major topic. It's something that we are always needing expertise on, and so yeah, it's just. We're very happy to have you here, Emily. So uh, yeah, and also thank you for being on the show today and taking time out of your busy day because I know you got lots going on getting started here. So yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm happy yes. to join you guys. Well, Ken, uh, as someone who uh, I'll be I'll be quizzing Ken also just constantly on tree questions. And so uh, would you mind kicking off the questions? Uh, I can do that. My answer is going to be it depends for everything. <laughs> Oh, he knows the Good answer. answer. Good answer. Does that work? Does that work on the certified arborist exam, though? <laughs> we'll find out. Probably not. <laughs> All right. So we're we're coming up on fall, and one common thing we hear about in the fall is just good time to plant trees and and shrubs too, if we want to throw those in there. Uh, is this actually the case? Fall is a good time, and and why would that be, or not be? Well, it depends. Is <laughs> the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so fall is an excellent time to plant deciduous uh, trees and shrubs. So those are the ones that would drop their leaves um, coming up into and going into a dormant season here in the winter. And um, it would be recommended to wait to plant those conifers that retain their leaves or their needles uh, throughout the winter. Um, and the reason for that is, is a little, um, it, it's related to them holding their leaves during the winter. So um, during our Midwestern you know, winters, we have a lot of um, solar radiation, solar power um, that is still going to be um, hitting our, our plant materials. Without the leaves, dormant trees are not going to have the water demand that trees that are going to have their needles or leaves um, on their on the trunks or on the um, trees. That persistent leaf is going to continue to do some transpiration, especially on those days where the temperature warms up a little bit. This can stress the, the trees out um, because the ground has been frozen for a while and so water is not available for those roots to um, deliver up through the tree into those leaves and replenish the supply. So um, that can be stressful, especially for newly planted uh, conifers. Those trees that lose their leaves, deciduous trees don't have that stress. And so they actually get a bonus season of root growth um, if you plant them here in the fall. So the above, ground plant material is going dormant much sooner than our below ground plant material is going to be um, going dormant. The soils by nature of having um, moisture in them and then the, the material they're made of freezes a lot later in the season than what our ambient air temperature does. And so those roots are actually going to continue to grow for us um, and get established in the soil um, after being planted in the fall. And they would be um, if we planted them in say April, which is it, probably the earliest many of us will be planting trees in the spring. And so um, the answer to is it a good time to plant is it depends. Conifers maybe wait um, or take extra precautions to protect them in the uh, throughout the winter months. But deciduous trees is a really good time to plant um, right now up through actually when the ground freezes. Um, so get them in the ground. You know, Emily, I, I love using this word. So our state climatologist, Trent Ford, he taught me this word and I like to sound smart. So I use it all the time. Um, but he's he describes summer with like climate change and everything. He says it's like we have this thermal inertia that's pushing summer kind of later for us. And I've noticed the last couple of years, like right now, mm -hmm. it's very dry. So I know folks that if you've planted evergreens in the spring, um, you know, we, we still got to be watering those trees even right now as we go into fall. Because you mentioned when the soil is frozen, there's no water. I, yeah. I equate frozen soil to drought. I mean, it's like the same thing. It actually. kind of is. Yeah. And while the um, roots are, you know, have an above freezing temperatures, they're going to be taking up that water. And so it's going to be best for all of our trees to go into winter being as hydrated as they possibly can, um, especially those conifers that are going to retain their, their leaves. You want to make sure that you know, they've got enough. They're not going in at a deficit um, of moisture because they're going to lose some, regardless of what kind of winter we have, they will lose some moisture over the course of the winter. Um, it matters. Of, it kind of depends on their survivability and how they fare the winter depends on how much moisture they have going into the winter and then you know, what kind of winter we do experience. So. so Emily, I have diagnosed a lot of trees 
with like the chainsaw. You know, it's like they call me up, they say, Can you look at my <clears throat> autumn blaze maple? I mean tree. And I'm like, I go, I look at him like, ah, oh, just gotta zik. Now, when we're planting trees, what what are some of the things that we need to consider in terms of like just our yard? Like where what type of conditions do we need to think about? before we even put that shovel in the ground so we don't have to pay $500 for some company to come cut it down for us? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So thanks for asking it. Um, in the arboriculture world, you'll often hear folks say, right tree, right place. It's a real catchy phrase that basically means like you need to do an, an appropriate and a proper site assessment um, to match the site conditions with the tree species that you are desiring to plant. Um, you'd mentioned at the top of the show, these are um, plant materials that are extremely long-lived and they're extremely valuable in our landscape, especially those um, really large species that take decades to reach maturity. Uh, you cannot replace that as quickly over you know, a growing season or a couple of growing seasons, like say perennials, annual perennials or shrubs. Um, so the thoughtfulness that you're gonna put into um, tree selection when you're planting it is worth the investment. It is worth the research, it's worth the study of your site. And so, you know, at, at minimum, right tree, right, right place would be considering the available size of your landscape that the tree is going to be planted in, um, considering what adjacent site amenities are there. So is it being planted next to a house, next to a roadway, next to um, utilities, you know, overhead utilities, are those present? Um, other things would be, what is the soil like? So is it a native soil that is um, you know, loamy and, and rich in nutrients, or is it on a site that has been um, influenced by construction and have compacted soils or modified soils? There are tree species that are better able to tolerate some of those site conditions. And so knowing that about the soil can help influence your decision. Um, solar exposure would be another um, consideration. So is your site shaded? Um, heavily shaded, moderately shaded, or is it um, exposed to full sun? Again, there are different species that have different tolerances for these site conditions. And so matching the species to the site is going to um, minimize your maintenance, but also give you a, a healthier, longer lived um, tree specimen um, over, over time. And then finally, to me, when you're planting a tree, you um, certainly want to match all of the site prioritize matching the site conditions to the tree species, but then aesthetics. You know, you, you'd mentioned like we are, you know, students of landscape architecture, like that matters to people, like how the tree is gonna look. What are some of the characteristics that you desire in your tree? What are some of the um, functions that you want your tree to, to perform for you? So one of the main ones that I think um, we talk about, but doesn't always get um, maybe equated to trees so much is habitat for pollinators, for wildlife. Um, trees are essential. Um, first foods for some of those early emerging pollinators without um, you know, tree cover and tree you know, canopies available for um, you know, larva, you can't have um, birds, the migratory birds, you know, songbirds that we all enjoy. So um, if that's a priority for you, then picking species that are gonna serve that purpose. Um, Flowers, you know, blooming trees are another aesthetic that people like, fall color. Um, there's a whole whole variety of different things you can consider, but that's one that you would want to add to your list of, of criteria as you're looking at planting a tree. Yeah, was it um, Bringing Nature Home, the Doug Townley book, and looking at oaks, so there's what, I don't know how many hundreds of species of insects that rely on, just on oaks. Um, yeah, I think it's over 400, if, if memory serves. And, um, yeah, and that's just one tree. So uh, for folks unfamiliar with that, that research, he analyzed the um, number of different species at different life cycles of Lepidoptera. So um, moths or butterflies, you can correct me if I am interpreting that wrong, but um, the Lepidoptera um, family, and I think it was over 401 mature oak tree. And so, um, you know, of course, oaks are so prevalent in our landscapes and our woodlands. Uh, they're the state tree of many states, including Illinois, Iowa, you know, the neighbor next door. Um, you know, so it's it's really incredible what trees can do in, in terms of wildlife and um, in our communities. So then, and sticking to the aesthetics here, since we're coming up on fall, what are some good trees for fall color that are not maples? So usually we think of maples as being, you know, fall color and everybody plants maples, but 
Yeah, sorry, what sorry. We just we're gonna scratch that one off the list right now, Emily. Um, nothing wrong with maples. They're just great. They're great trees. But uh, what else? <laughs> so I support the discouraging um, the conversation around maples, not because they're not good trees. They're they're native trees. They're good for um, wildlife. They have their their value. I think what you all are getting at is that they're overplanted. Uh, we rely too heavily on them, and as people in the horticulture industry. Um, we have learned hopefully our lesson about overplanting singular species, right? Um, I hope so. I don't know about that. Yeah. We're trying, we're trying and you guys are educating folks. So uh, little by little, um, but yeah, the specimen maple is, can be stunning. And I would support one in your landscape. I grew up with a maple tree, sugar maple. And so um, I have an affection for that singular tree. Mm -hmm. I have not planted a maple personally in decades um, yeah. because of it. So. Other trees that are, are um, equally, if not uh, more beautiful for fall color would be things, um, I'm gonna go back to the oaks off the top. You know, there's the white oak families and the red oak family. Um, they offer different things um, in terms of aesthetics. So if you're looking for a really stunning fall color, the red oak family would be the ones you're gonna wanna look into. Um, they have more of that brilliant red that people like and people you know, seek out. So scarlet oaks, red oaks, northern pin oaks. Um, they, those are species that are, um, if well placed in a landscape, because they're large trees, can provide some really stunning uh, red color. White oaks, on the other hand, so your bur oak, your swamp, um, have a more muted, a, a more subtle um, fall color to them, like purplish, bronze, you know, brownish color, depending on the, the season. Um, beautiful in their own right, but just if you're looking for that red fall color, you'd want to lean towards the red oak family. Um, other things are like uh, uh, black tupelo or Nissa sylvatica is um, a medium-sized tree is how I would categorize it, maybe 50 feet um, in mature size, but brilliant red, like just glowing red um, fall color. And it's got some dark berries that are attractive. Um, and Chris, you had mentioned earlier when we were discussing the, the spring color also has mm -hmm. some appeal. And so, you know, that would be a tree that's more than a singular season. Um, Tree. Others that do that for us um, would be things like uh, river birch. So the river birch is a really tolerant tree. Nissa is also really tolerant of like wet sites or harsher sites, um, which can be um, challenging for some folks. Um, river birch has a yellow fall color, but in addition to that, like once those leaves drop, the um, bark is really stunning. It can have some winter interest and winter appeal. Um, I would encourage folks to plant river birch instead of white birch. Um, it's got more tolerance uh, to bronze birch borer. And so um, river birch, that native river birch is what I would um, recommend folks going with. Um, gosh, some other ones. So ginkgo also has that yellow fall color. Mm -hmm. You've gotta be careful. Um, I always caution folks that if you are looking, and you know where I'm going. This is not native um, to North America. And so from a pollinator standpoint, from a wildlife um, habitat standpoint, you might as well put you know, a, a plastic palm tree in your yard. But if you are um, putting it as one of the trees in your yard and you're accommodating those, you know, those pollinators that wildlife elsewhere, I think that the ginkgo has that really cool um, leaf shape. Um, it has really brilliant yellow um, fall foliage. One of the fun characteristics, I'm gonna qualify this fun, uh, characteristics about it is that it will turn just brilliant gold and then overnight drop pretty much all of its leaves. Yep. <laughs> so you will, um, if you see it and you love it and you wanna take a picture, I recommend taking a picture right away because there's no guarantee that those leaves will be there the next day, it, it's <laughs> a quick drop. Um, Park, you also parks want departments to, love that one because they don't have to come back to clean that up. Yeah, yep. it's one and done. Yep. Yeah. Um, with the ginkgo, if you can, and there's some um, gray area on this, but you want to try to get uh, a male cultivar. They have a fruit that is fragrant and not in um, a generally agreed upon good way. Uh, it can it can be um, off putting in a home landscape. And so try to get a male um, male cultivar. Some have claimed that they, they will revert. And so um, it's maybe not a guarantee either um, that you would have a fruitless ginkgo, but I still think they're worth it. 
I think they're cool. Yeah. 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 And females, old, you know, males, they're all great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And there's um Ben Fossils um found that um of the ginkgo leaves dating back to the time of the dinosaurs. And so it's kind of fun to see like a living fossil um relative. So um what else? I'm trying to to recall other things like they're smaller, maybe it's not a replacement for a maple, um, the size wise, but things like um your flowering dogwoods or your um uh, oh Circus canadensis come on guys red bug red bug, red bug. Mm -hmm. um you know they have blooms in the spring and then they have really lovely fall color um red bud turns yellow and then the dogwoods turn kind of a reddish orangish color um but I try to get things that have more than one season interest so it could be a few of my mm -hmm. of my recommendations yeah, we could be here all day, I think, because. going over these <laughs> these trees with good fall color. Yeah. Next episode. Next episode. <laughs> there you go. Part two, trees with continuing good fall color. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll Do say... Do you guys have any favorites? Hmm. I, I, I really like the that rusty color of bald cypress in the fall. Yes. Yeah. I like sweet gum. I know so a lot of sweet, people hate sweet gum, but I like those trees. Yeah, those are good choices. So bald cypress is one of my favorites. Um, if I had to, you know, favorite trees just in general, because it is that deciduous conifer, and it looks really cool when it turns um, in the fall. The sweet gum, we don't get that sunny fall color up north here. We're a little bit northern Illinois, and so it's really, it the tree does fine, but that that fall color is not what those southern southern trees put on. So. Mm -hmm. Um, then we just we get the the gumballs until we have to deal with those. But it is a good tree. Really good. Gumballs are the best part of the tree. They're fun. They hurt if you walk on them, <laughs> but just don't do that, and then they're really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get them all together, and uh, yeah, you can create a nice little hazard for people trying to sneak through your yard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Emily, what? I mean, we. Sorry to be so negative, but I deal with problems in trees all the time. Yeah. Um, and I often see a tree planted way too deep. So explain what what are we talking about when we mean trees planted too deep? And um, yeah, why, why does this keep happening? <laughs> yeah, it is a frustrating um, problem once you know what you're looking for. So mm -hmm. From my observations and from my experience, the um, challenge originates in what we're getting from the nursery industry. Um, a lot of the trees that we get are coming to us too deep. And I think that's just because of how our trees are produced. You know, they're, they're potted up year after year. And so soil is added to the root ball year after year. Um, I'm not, you know, blaming anybody. It just is a reality of how we, we have our trees grown. And so I think it's important for the public to be aware that um, when you purchase a tree from the, um, you know, the nursery or the landscape industry, what you wanna do is you wanna look for what is called the first lateral root. And so you might have to actually dig out some of that um, soil material around the root ball to find what is um, a, a significant sized root on, on the root ball. And that is the level you wanna plant the tree at or higher. So planting trees too deep can lead to all sorts of health problems that essentially the trunk material that is typically above ground becomes below ground. And it's not meant to have the um, soil touching it, the constant moisture being on that um, bark material. It stresses the tree out. It can have, um, it can be a, a um, point of entry for pathogens into the tree and um, can be a real, just, it can be an easily corrected, but often not corrected uh, way to um, have a more healthy, you know, um, viable tree in the long term. And so I'm just digging down, taking off some of that root material or some of that soil material and uh, planting at the right at the right depth um, can be critical. So speaking of planting, mm -hmm. um, I think we had mentioned this uh, post-construction soil earlier when we were talking about site conditions. Um, let's say I got some lousy soil. Should I be making my planting hole, amending it, throwing a bunch of compost in there to uh, give this tree a nice home? So kind of, or it depends. Um, okay. So Those, that, that answer. Back uh -huh. to that one. 
Um, ideally, in those conditions, we would go back to that right tree, right place. Um, and so we would want to make sure that the tree species that we're trying to plant into those soil conditions can tolerate a, a harsher um, environment. And so um, a lot of times com compacted soils, clay soils will, will either retain moisture, um, you know, it, uh, they don't drain as well, so it can be kind of soggy, um, can be a bit on the anaerobic side of things. And so some tree species will tolerate that well, some will not. And so that's the first place you would want to start. But then no matter what species you select, um, digging a big enough planting hole is going to be your first defense against how um, that tree gets established. Um, basically, what you want to do is divide uh, or um, dig the hole about three times as wide as the um, root ball. And I know I have seen it. I have been that person uh, that says like, oh, the soil is so hard. I need to get all mm -hmm. these trees planted. It's hot or I'm tired or, you know, like, let's just hurry up and do this. Um, it is worth the investment of time and energy to, to dig that hole bigger. Um, again, these are very long lived species. And so you want to you kind of get one shot at planting them. Ideally, you plant it right the first time and then you um, set the tree off on the right path. And so digging a hole that is three times as wide as the root ball um, itself is gonna be the, the best way to help that tree get established in the site. You can do some soil modifications. Um, a fertilizer is not recommended, so compost in there would not be um, you know, overly recommended because what you wanna do is you wanna encourage those roots um, to grow out into that native soil. Trees are, are massive and that tree root system hopefully will be you know, uh, quite large and get established in that, that native soil or that um, the surrounding soil. So sometimes if we make it too um, comfortable in our planting hole, the roots can, can tend to just concentrate there and have a harder time getting established outside of it. Um, and so you could incorporate a little bit of sand if you wanted to help a little bit of drainage, but it's generally not recommended um, to do too much to the soil besides dig a bigger hole. Yep, and I, I com I'm complaining the whole time while I watch <laughs> my gardener plant those trees. So yeah, just kidding. I don't have a gardener. <laughs> um, so, okay, so amend the soil. Yeah, it depends, likely not. We want that native mm -hmm. soil to kind of be consistent across the board there. What about removing uh, the ball, the, the burlap from, or the wire cage uh, from, from the root ball? Should, there's, there's conflicting advice on this one. I mean, there's families that have been torn apart from this <laughs> argument. Uh, it's just like the Civil War all over again. So um, should we leave the wire cage and burlap on? Oh, I, it breaks my heart to hear that families have been torn apart over this. <laughs> uh, well, let's try to set the record straight. <laughs> It should be taken off. So a ball and burlap tree is one that is often field grown. And so you would um, use a spade, dig it out of a, a, a soil material. It's not in a container in the nursery. It would be grown into its actual ground. Um, you know, burlap in the, the wire cages and put on it to maintain the integrity of that root ball. And then as it's transported to the site. Now, uh, some of the challenges with that type of a, a root ball versus a container root ball is that you have, um, a lot more loose soil around it. And so you don't want to take the root ball apart or take the, the burlap off or the cage off um, before you get it into the, the planting hole because often it can just fall apart and then you have a massive um, uh, bare root tree, which can be hard to, to deal with you know, in, in terms of just the size of the tree that you're planting because it was a ball and burlap. Um, it also requires a different kind of planting strategy and those bare roots can dry out quickly. And so it can actually be detrimental to the tree. So you wanna maintain the integrity of the root ball while you're planting it. So generally you would dig your hole three times as large as you need to, um, place the entire um, ball and burlap cage on, um, use that to lift the tree into the hole and then um, get down on your, your hands and knees and reach down into that hole as far as you possibly can with your wire cutters and your um, your knife to remove that cage as low as you possibly can and then cut off that burlap and remove it from the hole. Um, I know the argument that uh, burlap will de you know, deteriorate and that the wire cage um, does not impede root growth. Studies have shown that it, it can actually impede root growth. It can, um, you know, if the tree gets so large and the, the wire um, cage does not deteriorate, it can girdle um, the tree or the trunk depending on you know, the size and the placement. And then that burlap, 
could deteriorate over time. It's just not a risk that we would want to take because oftentimes there's a treatment on there that slows down the um, deterioration of it. And so um, you're investing a lot of time, energy, and often um, financial resource into planting brown burlap trees. Uh, taking the additional uh, step just to remove that cage in that burlap is um, going to be your best bet to ensure your, your trees establish as well. Exactly. I'd say why someone said, well, that burlap will be gone in five years. Like, well, I don't want to wait five years for my roots to get in the ground. So yeah. get it off right now. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. Last planting question for you, Emily. Yeah. Um, let's say we plant our tree and we see the neighbors, everybody else, they stake their trees. So we are going to put some stakes in the ground for our tree. Should we, should we not? What's the, what's the right answer here? It depends. Oh, it's another one of those. <laughs> it so in a perfect world, you would not need to stake a tree. And, and the conditions that would um, help you make that decision would be the size of the root ball and the stability of the tree. And so, like I had mentioned earlier, hopefully you're just planting this tree once, you're getting it in the ground um, one time, and then you know the tree is going to be able to establish itself. Now, trees that don't have an adequate sized root ball on them, if the canopy is bigger than what the, the root ball is going to be able to accommodate um, in terms of stability, then you would want to provide some supplemental uh, support for that tree while it's getting established and while the root system is getting um, you know, redeveloped or developing for the first time, perhaps. Um, with staking, um, you want to stake it loose so that the tree can do some, some movement. You don't want it to tip over, of course, and you want it to, to stay upright while it's getting established. Um, but trees naturally need to, re need to um, develop some wind resistance. And so having a loose stake on the tree, um, if it is deemed necessary, so that the tree can, can sway in the wind you know, a couple inches to you know, either side um, is recommended. And then put on your calendar for a year later to come back and check it. Um, you want to make sure and check it, you know, more frequently than that. But hopefully, within a year, you can actually remove the stake if the tree has become um, established enough to support itself with its root system. Um, I say check it often throughout the year to make sure that, that stake or that that tie is not causing any damage um, to the the trunk of the tree because that movement and then the material that is chosen for those stakes can be um, can actually wear on the trunk and that can be a point of um, you know. A, a, source of you know, fungal infection or you can actually just harm the tree and we don't want that because we're trying to help establish our trees yeah so so don't tie them up too long yeah they're, mm -hmm. they're well not... and they're not going to go anywhere they're not going to run away like i've never seen a tree run away so you don't need to tie it down forever um exactly it, yeah one of the um one value that I, I'd see stakes, not necessarily ties, um, but stakes playing in like a commercial landscape or in um, a landscape that is managed not by the person who planted the tree um, or, or a heavily perfressed area, mowed area, is that it can deter mowers from getting near the trunk of the tree. Mulch is up really well too, but um, an iron post, you know, a couple iron posts around the tree can really stop a mower um, from damaging the trunk of the tree. And so, I will sometimes encourage folks to take the tie off and leave the stakes in the ground if they don't mind uh, the visual of stakes in the ground to just keep mowers away. Mm. Yeah, stuff. mowers, they're about as bad as deer, you know, they're, they just, are, they're yeah. terrible animals. Yep, yep and spring trimmers. <laughs> if I can remember, I think Ken's editing this week, I'll send Ken a picture of a uh, white oak tree that I visited and the homeowners had no idea what to do because they had it staked for years. And when they took the stakes off, the tree literally just flopped over in the alleyway. And so I'll try to remember to send you that picture, Ken. He'll post, he'll throw it up right now. And then right now is going to be a picture of Ken's dog. Now a picture of Ken being very angry at me. Because I'm I'll making try to him send do all these a, pictures. I'll try to send you a picture of a, a tie that was left on too, too long. And then the tree actually grew, mm -hmm. you know, in diameter and um, started to, to uh, encompass that. It was a, it's a rope material. Mm -hmm. um, which is also um, a weak point. You can create a weak point on the tree, and I've seen trees just snap, just snap off yeah. at that point over time. Yeah, because yeah, not all of the rope or the burlap, not all that stuff is natural. Some of it's even synthetic, and mm -hmm. it doesn't decompose no matter what we do or throw at it. Yeah. Yep. One um one material that is pretty easy. I used to so in my previous work that we talked about, I worked with um, volunteers and communities, and we would get grant money. 
uh, to plant trees, but then like all the support um, you know, stakes and whatnot would not be included in that grant so we would um, seek donations. And one of the, the least expensive um, fun, I guess, if you will, um, ways to tie a tree would be um, with the legs of old pantyhose. Uh, that material, it works pretty well um, in giving the tree some flexibility to move around. You can, it will hold it upright, but it also deteriorates over time. And it, it will just break down in the elements. And so you still need to go out and check it. But um, if you forget the tree, and I've seen people do it, uh, forget you know to go check on the tree for a year or two, um, that will oftentimes kind of just uh, erode itself off of the tree. So. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. Well, your old pantyhose. My <laughs> <laughs> I know what to use my hands for. <laughs> All right. So once we've got our trees in the ground, they're planted, and we've taken that burlap and that wire off. If we're doing bald and burlap, what should we do after that <clears throat> to help get them established and, and survive? Yeah. So regardless of the season you're planting, spring or fall, uh, mulch is recommended. Um, and you want to put this on, I'm sure you guys have covered this before, but you want to put the donut shape of um, three to four inches of mulch around your tree instead of that volcano. Uh, keep that mulch material off of the trunk of the tree, but um, you know, mulch around the, around the root ball. Bigger is better when it comes to, to mulchings. Um, you know, in the woodlands where many of these trees develop, the whole entire um, you know, root zone is covered in mulch, leaf material you know, that's on the, the forest floor. And so um, if folks are willing and able of uh, mulching all the way up to the drip line of a tree um, would be most recommended. But as much as you can, can afford or can tolerate, um, the, bigger, the bigger the mulching, the better. And that just helps maintain um, moisture into the soil. During the winter months here, as we're coming into um, you know, the cold season, it's going to help moderate some of those temperature fluctuations as well, keeping that moisture in the soil. You're not going to have um, these massive temperature swings which is going to help eliminate uh, you know, the chance of having frost heave. Um, so your tree just getting shoved out of the soil because the ground is you know, freezing and thawing. Um, and so mulch is highly recommended and, and doing it seasonally, um, checking it now, making sure that your trees still have mulch on them, even as we, if we did it in the spring, they might be okay, they might not, we check them again. Um, and then water. Um, you know, it, we've had some good rainfalls up here um, of late and so in Northern Illinois. And so um, much of the soil has adequate moisture in it. That's not a guarantee throughout the rest of the, the autumn. And so making sure that we're providing supplemental water when we, the ground is starting to dry out. Or um, newly planted trees as well as established trees. You know, Emily, um, we mentioned Doug Tallamy earlier and then just going back to mulch really quick. Mm -hmm. um, we had a educator and she wrote an article called Soft Landings where like the Lepidoptera, the caterpillars, all the insects feeding on the leaves, what do they do? Well, they drop down to the ground, the soil, and they pupate in the soil. But often for us, that's turf grass, and we just chop them up or whatever. So she wrote about soft landings and having ground cover underneath. So I, I think if we think, I, I'm thinking of like talking about converting people that the insects are not bad, they are good. Um, and so the idea like, all right, let's first let's plant our oaks and we'll do our mulch and then maybe we'll do some ground cover. Oh, let's do some native plants. Let's do some flowering plants. And so I'm, I'm going to try to, we're, we're building this whole thing up here to be insects are good. We, we need our bugs. So uh, and Ken's think, giving me the thumbs up. I think you're uh, on to something like this. There we go. There we go. This is going to be fun. Right, Ken? Exactly. <laughs> All right, Emily, so it is end of August. It's hot right now. It's pretty dry, at least in my neck of the woods. I think Ken can say the same, pretty dry. Yep. How, how about yourself, Emily? Is it pretty dry where you're located? Um, we're doing okay. We've had some pretty good rainfall this morning, actually. We had a big thunderstorm roll through. Um, it's a bit spotty, though, and so um, it's not a guarantee that everyone's soil is, is adequately um, separated. Okay. I, I guess because our weather conditions are so different because mm -hmm. we're a very long state, there's a lot of things that can, can change. What what should we in Illinois be doing right now for our, our trees and shrubs? Um, well, like I said, checking the mulch and then you know, provide, providing um, moisture if you haven't been blessed with you know, rainfall or adequate rainfall. If you have had rain, still go check your soil to make sure that you don't need to provide adequate 
or um, supplemental water. Um, you can overwater trees. That is, I guess, one thing we haven't talked about is that it is possible to overwater trees, especially species that do not, that are like upland species that don't like to have what we call like wet feet. Um, and so doing it once a week, watering once a week, checking, and then providing that moisture um, is, is enough. You don't need to go out there every day, you water every day, um, save yourself some time and energy, and then also um, you know, don't waste the water on the tree because it's not going to be used and it could be harmful. Um, other things not to do, so I know you asked me what to do. One of the things not to do would be to start pruning trees. Um, oh, yeah. No pruning. You know, it's tempting. Um, it is tempting to get out there and start, you know, putting the garden to rest, you know, in these coming months, like when you've got time or, you know, the energy kind of wrapping up the season. Um, we talked about the fall color, like what that, what is causing that is the, um, is chlorophyll shutting down and the tree actually taking the sugars that are available in the canopy of leaves. That's where photosynthesis takes place. That's the production of sugar for trees. It is migrating those sugars actually down into the root systems for storage over winter. So it's got carbohydrates available. Next spring, you then break bud and push out new leaves um, while um, you know it's waiting for having to have those food factories again. It needs to make them first. And so if we start pruning our trees right now, two things can happen. We can remove the sugar sources that are that the tree spent the summer making, and now it's not going to be able to, um, to store over the winter. It can also cause the tree to have an adverse reaction where it, it thinks that it needs to put out a flush of leaves. And so it can actually cause the tree to put out more, um, kind, of, kind of do a rejuvenation um, flush of leaves, which can deplete some of those stores also of carbohydrates. And so um, just hang on. Winter is a good time to prune trees. So you don't have to wait long. You just got to wait till it gets dormant. Um, the trees go dormant and the water gets a little cooler. And then we can start doing some pruning um, activities. All right. Last question. And the most important question we've asked you all day. What is your favorite tree and why? Okay. That's not fair. Um, Cause it depends. it depends. Ah, that answer again. I knew it. <laughs> Um, well, okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of different answers. From an emotional standpoint, there um, is a Baroque in my mom and dad's pasture that I grew up with. I grew up climbing it. Um, it's a gnarly old tree. Like, it's not going to win any beauty prizes, but like, I love that tree so much from the memories I've made. You know, it would, it keeps all my secrets from when I was a little girl. Um, yes, those are, those are good trees to keep your secrets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Never said a word. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I have a real affection for that tree. And I think those trees are equally as important as the ones you know, that are in our communities um, everywhere. I really love cottonwood. Cottonwood is not a tree that we, we talk about a lot, but it is, um, it's a water hog, what I call it. You know? And so in um, wet areas and spaces that can, um, can tolerate such a really large tree, they're fast growing, so they can have um, a little bit of mess associated with them. Um, their leaves are pretty big. They've got some seeds um, that people don't necessarily want maybe in their front yard, but in like a water area, um, you know, in a drainage ditch, or like they're just they're stunning, um, just really stunning trees. And um, birds are the cottonwood. And then from a community tree standpoint, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's the a place. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a mix. I, that's a hard question because there's a right place for a right tree all the time we're going back to that you know it, it totally depends on what well, we mentioned bald cypress I love that tree you know there's there's a a place for every tree um just gotta find it mm -hmm. yeah well you know when we have this under the canopy thing that we we have at our office we hand out to people whenever they have tree questions Ken's got it right yeah. there yeah under the canopy we have <laughs> thousands of these things at each office so you better come and take them listeners and viewers whoever you are um and and hand them out and throw them in your neighbor's truck so but it it's the thing though emily and someone always says like what tree should i plant and my mind goes totally blank and i'm like i have no idea i can't think of anything right now yeah so i yeah. hand them this under the canopy and it's got a lot of great information a lot of what we talked about today yeah it's a it's a really valuable resource it's also a really gorgeous poster um, yep. You mentioned that, that that when you open it all the way up, it's a really gorgeous poster. So I like to give it to teachers, to you know, educators, to folks that um, have the space to display it because 
it's a really nice publication. Well, that was a lot of great information about trees. So Emily Zweihart, horticulture educator in the Quad Cities area. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It was, it was fun. I'll talk trees all day long. So. Oh, and we have to get together sometime so we can talk trees and reminisce. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes. Well, the Good Grind Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension and edited this week by Ken Johnson, pictured right here, as you can see him. <laughs> He's going to kill me. Um, so, uh, Ken, of course, thank you very much for being here and tolerating me for another week. Well, thank you, Emily, for being on. Uh, I learned a lot. And thank you, Chris, for steering the ship. And let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. It'll be a Garden Bite episode, so a short one, but we have a lot more episodes planned for you this fall, and we are excited to get everything going in the ground. Everything, Everything's about to cool off, and nature's about to give one last display here this summer and this fall. It's going to be great. We're excited for it. Uh, so we're going to have lots of shows coming up. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.